I am sure all of us will go back to our homes better men, and I know we shall appreciate the small things in life, things that we took for granted in our complacent lives of former times. As an example, I went wild with joy when a Yank gave me some Waldorf toilet paper. Of course, our first question was, when do we eat? They say GI food is on the way. I had some coffee from a K ration, which I used to throw away, and did not know what it was. I got a piece of Wrigley gum, is it good? The 44th is in bad orb. We were all given six cigarettes. We are to move out as soon as trucks arrive. They are trying to move us out today, and we may be evacuated by planes. The sooner the better. I like it. Men have been fighting, trying to get rations, etc. I didn't know everyone had such energy left. Some of the Yanks tasted our food and spit it out. Tuesday, 3rd April. Today we started eating G.I. Chow, and from now on we live as men should live. I have been living for three months to eat my first GI meal, and the joy was greater than my furthest expectation. I had cereal, candy and some wheat honey. All were delicious. I also got a tropical bar and pack of cigarettes. We shall probably stay here a few more days until available transportation is arranged, but now that our worries are over, who cares? Still waiting for evacuation. Men are running all over the country. We are under guard again. Men are stealing food from the front-line troops came back with some food, and it really tasted good. I ate cold ham and eggs for the first time. The D-bar was the best yet. I am living for that first GI meal. We have been given some cigarettes. Wednesday, 4th April. Too sick from GI chow to make an entry. I ate myself sick and then vomited and had 15 bowel movements. Thursday, 5th April. I went on sick call for GIs and gas, had some bicarbonate of soda. I still have cramps and am weak, not hungry. The mobile unit came up and we got donuts and coffee. They sure were good. I would eat those no matter how I felt. I got to write my first V-mail today, wrote to Aunt Louise and Charles. It sure felt good to write home. I have more candy, cigarettes and gum than ever before. Great gods, listen to the whoom of those mortars. I hear the squeak, squeak, squeak of tank treads. Listen, listen, listen. Pet interrupts me. I can hear. Quit jumping around. OK, OK, I'm just anxious. It will happen when it happens. It shouldn't be too long. I don't hear voices. Hell, Hig, it is not a Boy Scout trip. You expect whoever is out there to announce their arrival? I wonder which army will liberate us. The barracks shakes from the artillery, mortar and bazooka shells that fall around the camp. The smell of gunpowder seeps through the windows and cracks in the siding. No one is asleep. I am restless, apprehensive and scared, but still suspicious. There have been too many disappointments in the past few months. We prisoners of war have been jerked around, experienced broken promises. I don't trust anything or anybody. I don't want to be negative. I want to survive. A stillness of anticipation settles on the 200-plus men in the barracks. The silence is eerie, broken by the noise of guns in the forest around the camp. I stare through the window on the other side of the barracks as night turns into a greyish-black dawn. My body is tense. I listen. I hear the crunch of a fence, tank treads squeaking over the wire, the bang-bang pop of rifles. I look at my watch. It is exactly 8 a.m. April 2nd, 1945. The barracks erupts. Bedlam reigns. Here they come! Here they come! Oh, man, I see Americans! At last! And tankers, too! The nightmare is over. Men climb, kick me to get at my window. I jump up. I see four armoured attack vehicles come roaring down the road from the main gate. When our barracks door is opened or knocked down, I am not sure which. I see former prisoners of war are all over the tanks, begging for food, asking a million questions. I rush out of the barracks. Someone asks what outfit. Some unit from Patton's 2nd Cavalry Division. Yeah, might have known it. Old Georgie did it. Free, free. No lock on the barracks door. I run around in circles like a small kid at recess. The American compound of Stalag 9B is Bedlam. We act like a bunch of bees whose hive has been poked with a stick. 4,000 former American prisoners of war yell, wave their arms, jump up and down. The American vehicles can't move. They are surrounded. Men climb on them. They ask the same questions over and over. When do we get out of here? Food, food, where is the food? When do we get American chow? The American liberators throw boxes of K rations to the crowd. Each box is about nine inches by four inches. Some get a breakfast box or a dinner or the supper. 
A breakfast K ration is ripped open. Out falls a small can of meat and eggs, hard biscuits, cereal, a package of sugar, a piece of chewing gum, a pack of four camel cigarettes and a fruit bar. I grab the only thing left, the lousy fruit bar. Hey, I will trade my fruit bar for anything. I've got enough problems with them now. I don't need any help. A happy ex-prisoner of war says, trade it to the Ruskies or the French. Another ex-prisoner of war gets a dinner K ration. Oh man, never thought I'd be glad to see one of these. He rips it open. Starving men crowd around, grabbing for something. Here, take the biscuits. You can have the lemonade. You the four lumps of sugar and here is one piece of chewing gum. Quit grabbing. Let me have smokes. Go to hell. These are lucky strikes. I will keep all four of them. Here, take the matches. I think of my diarrhoea. How about the block of cheese? I will keep it. Maybe it will stop these damn runs. Joe, here is the small candy bar. You take it. I crowd closer to get something. Anything. My small body, already weak, is shoved out of the way. I get nothing. An American soldier from one of the tanks throws another K-ration into the crowd. I almost get it, but once again I'm shoved out of the way. Hey, look here. It is a supper K-ration. What's it got in it? I ever had one of those. Let me see, the lucky fellow says. Here's a can of beef. Wow. Some bouillon cubes and crackers and biscuits and... Someone grabs at the K ration. The lucky guy continues. Here is three packs of coffee and one piece of beechnut gum. What, no chewing tobacco? No, but there is a pack of four camel cigarettes. You can have them. I don't smoke. My hands grab for the cigarettes. I hadn't had a good cigarette in weeks, only some weird brand called Chelsea. Again, I lose out. I run to another American tank. A tanker searches in his blouse and retrieves a small pack of toilet paper. He throws it to me. Sorry, fellow, that's all I have left. Maybe you can use it. Wow, can I use it? The first toilet paper I have had in three months. Waldorf, too, I exclaim. I didn't know the army had anything that good. I snatch a piece of chewing gum from a fellow when he opens a pack. I put it in my mouth, taste the sweet flavour, and promptly swallow it. About that time a voice bellows, Hell, let's get out of here! I follow the crowd and run down the road. There are no gates, the fences have been ripped down and no Germans in sight. I stop a moment as I pass through what was the main gate. I look up. Thanks, God. Civilians carrying bags of clothes crowd the road. American armoured half-tracks rumble up the road, swinging its guns back and forth from one side of the road to the other into the forest. Small arms fire vibrates through the trees. Small puffs of smoke rise above the treetops. Somebody yells, Hell, they are still fighting around here. So what? Let us get into town. Freedom is paramount to safety. The battle in the woods is ignored. I push past the civilians, carts, kids, old people. We go into Bad Orb, locate an army mess tent and rush into it like a bunch of locusts. The soldiers give us tin plates and pile on eggs, bacon, biscuits, butter and potatoes. I drink the cup of coffee, slowly savouring each swallow. I didn't know army coffee could taste so good. While we are in the mess tent, an American officer roars up in a jeep and screams, There is still a war going on around here. Get back up the hill into the camp. We've got enough problems. You guys are in the way. Combat troops force us the two miles up the road to Stalag 9B. After everyone is back in the prison camp, the Russians come for their soldiers. The French are just turned loose. The Italians are already free and running around the country. Only the British and American prisoners of war will be flown out. I don't know how the other nation's prisoners of war will be sent home. Maybe they are not in any hurry, Tut says. They may be better off here than in a ripped-up country. Later, when everyone finally quiets down, Benner announces how and when we will leave Stalag 9B. Twenty-five prisoners an hour, British, then American. Stalag 9B is in the British zone, whatever that means. They have authority over what happens in this area. Somebody yells, We were liberated by Americans. I don't see any British troops except those behind this damn wire fence. I don't know, Benner answers in a tone of exasperation. Just be happy we are free. We will be out of here before too long. The grumbling continues all evening and into the night. As we finally settle down, Cleet exclaims, Might know the British would be first. Tuts replies, Well, that is the way it goes. Them that's got, gets. 
and the British have this part of Germany for the mop-up operation, Cleet snaps. Don't be so damned philosophical. I just want to get home. Some people are never happy or satisfied. As my eyes close, I smile and think, it is a good day, this first day of liberty, and it can only get better. Before daylight, Tuesday, the gates to the camp are repaired and locked. When we arise, the American and British soldiers guard the entrance. What the hell goes on? Why are we locked up? And by our own troops? I'm incredulous when Cleet returns from the latrine with the news. The complaints begin. I think, back to normal, complain, complain, complain. Benner yells, shut up you guys and I will tell you what happened. The barracks gets quiet. First, typhus is rampant among the German population. There is concern we might get contaminated, and that is the last thing the army wants to worry about. Second, we have lice, fleas, and a filthy. Look at those trenches outside the barracks, full of filth and vomit. The army is afraid we might contaminate the soldiers, so we must be deloused and get clean clothes before we can be returned to American control. Now, the trading, eating, and vomiting begins in earnest and lasts until I leave Stalag 9B six days later. The Russians trade their American rations for black bread, which I quickly trade for five cans of beans and three cans of eggs. Huckle says the Russians won't get sick from eating just black bread, adding, I don't see any trenches in their area. Cleet says, Nor, they just don't know good food. I will take all their sea rations for this lousy black bread. Pet replies, if that is all they have ever eaten, why change? I notice none of them are thin. They probably thrive on this prison food, and none of them is sick either. The Mexican-American prisoners of war swap for raw potatoes, barley, rye, any kind of meal, even black bread, then pound it with rocks to make a paste and fry it on some type of homemade griddle. Off comes a tortilla. They trade for pork and beans, which is made into a paste, I watch them cook, then trade a pack of smokes for a tortilla filled with a pasty mixture. Great gods, this is hot. Where did you get the peppers, or whatever makes it hot? One of them smiles. We have been raising them in the barracks in cans. I decide I can vomit without any help from their food. American troops set up some type of commissary to hand out food. Cartons of K-rations are given to anxious and outstretched hands. Each box has 24 K-rations. Three breakfasts, three dinners, and three suppers. Cleet takes one box. I take another one for the six in our group. No one knows anything about eating too much, so we eat and eat and vomit and eat some more. My arms get tired from cramming the food in my mouth. I eat, burp a sour taste, then eat some more. I don't bother to heat water for the six bouillon cubes. Just mix and drink the concentrated mixture in a pint tin cup. The orange aid is better than the lemonade, but I mix both in a can and drink the concoction. I then mix six packs of sugar with the second batch, which makes it sweeter. The confection bar is a one-ounce Hershey tropical chocolate. I read the label as I gobble it down. It has vitamin B1 for go power, cocoa butter and dry milk. The Americans give us unlimited cans of sea rations. Each one serves as a meal for one soldier. Most of the time, a company mess sergeant mixes a number of cans of the same item as a meal for a company. One sea ration contains eggs, another has meat, either pork or beef, and the third can is cheese. Another large can has a dessert, such as peaches or some kind of cake. There is toilet paper, chewing gum and matches in the packages, but no cigarettes since packs of 20 are freely given to smokers. I decide to get creative with the rations. I melt a D-bar, add ten sugar cubes, and a crumbled-up honey-wheat bar. The mixture tastes too sweet, so I add two bouillon cubes and a handful of Rice Krispies. You gonna eat that mess? Pet inquires as he stares at my mess kit boiling on the grill. Why not? Looks good to me. Reminds me of a game we played as kids called Vomit. We'd mix up everything in the kitchen, then take a mouthful. The last one to vomit is winner. Heck, I can vomit here just by eating. I don't need to mix up anything. I take a sip. Don't ask for a drink of this, you unimaginative jerks. Pet looks in horror at the mixture, then pretends to vomit as he says, Don't worry, you can have it all, and I hope you vomit all night. Fires for cooking are everywhere and burn all night. Men cook in steel helmets, lids to food cans, tin drinking cups, tops and bottoms of mess kits, anything and everything. I use a German mess kit because it is deep, 
has a lid and handle and will hold at least a pint of food. The camp resembles a Mexico City bazaar. Liberated prisoners of war trade sell and buy every conceivable uniform all sorts of trinkets. Makeshift stands, tables, pieces of cloths are set up in front of every barracks. I sit on the hill in front of the barracks and cook, eat, vomit, and watch the different nationalities walk up and down the road. Pet wonders, where did all these guys come from? The Germans must have been fighting the whole world. I never saw so many nationalities and heard so many languages. It is difficult to distinguish prisoners of war of the various nations by their uniforms. Over the years, prisoners of war have traded pieces of their uniforms for food and cigarettes or warmer clothes. Here come some Serbs. You remember them, don't you? Once they gave us a Red Cross box. I yell at a Serb I recognise. Hey, comrade. He still wears his pantaloons, a double-breasted tunic, but only one ankle boot. I point to it, make some motions with my hand and ask, What happened? He runs up to where I sit, jerks me off the ground and smothers me in his huge body, rubs his black beard over me and jabbers something in broken English like hungry, wanted food, then shrugs his shoulders and laughs. Here, you want some of our food? He grabs his nose, mutters aloud, Yanks nine. He laughs as he asks, Smokes? Yes. Everyone loves the American cigarettes. I hand him a pack of Chesterfields. He hugs me again, backs off a few feet. His right arm makes a salute. He bows. His voice cracks, and with a sad look in his eyes, comments in English, Good luck, my dear friend. He turns and runs to catch up with his buddies. My voice chokes as I reply, Best to you and thanks for everything. My eyes cloud. I squeeze tightly to hold back the tears. I turn to Pet. What the heck will happen to them? Pet shrugs his shoulders as he replies, No telling. You know, the Serbs, Czechs and Yogis are happy, friendly people, and they have been prisoners of war for no telling how long. I hope they have a good life after the war. What is the difference between Yogis, Czechs and Serbs? They seem to speak the same language and understand each other. Most of them are even in the same compound. Tut hears my comment. I think, from what I remember of high school history, there was one country until the war called Yugoslavia. The country was divided, and now there is a Serb section and a Croatian part. The reason you don't see many croaks is they are close to the Germans. Czechoslovakia is still another country. We just call them Czechs for short. Cleet says, You are a walking history book. I thought all you rebels learned was the differences between North and South. I say, Well, regardless of who is who, they sure saved us. No one else shared their food when we got here. At least ten thousands of the fourteen thousands in Stalag 9b wander between the compounds laughing and using sign language to communicate. In every conversation I hear the wondrous anticipation of life after the war. I will. I plan to. L want to. I dream and talk of the future as I continue to eat, vomit, eat or maybe eat and vomit and stool at the same time. The American doctors don't attempt to control the quality or quantity of food consumed, I guess their role is to stop the diarrhoea and severe cramps. Preventive medicine is not the order of the day. I am not sure anyone will listen anyway. It is too much fun eating and inventing recipes to try. The barracks walls are ripped out for firewood. It also makes it more convenient to lean over the floor and vomit on the ground. Eventually, a shallow trench is dug along the side of the barracks. That makes it even easier. I feel lousy. My stomach is doubled up with cramps. My mouth tastes like a sewer. Each faeces feels like ground glass going through sulfuric acid. Just before dark, I get some water, wash my underwear and pants, and put them on wet, even though the dampness on the raw cheeks stings my buttocks. But I never stop eating. My body aches from all the eating and vomiting. Cleet, who learned to scrounge in South Philly, returns from the American mess tent with more cans of sea rations and a few D-bars. These are three-inch-long, inch-thick chocolate bars given to combat troops to nibble on all day when it is impossible to get a hot meal or a K-ration. Each bar has sufficient protein and other food value to serve as a day's ration. I have stooled and vomited so many times I decide to keep score to detract from my misery. Say, men, let us keep a record of the number of times we crap. I will make a record. Pettingill, Huckle, Strubinger, Tothero and Mahoney join in the fun and games. By mid-afternoon, the results are tallied. 
I come in second place with 15 bowel movements. Pettingill wins with 16. What is my prize? He asks. Between moans and burps, I say, sleep outside, next to the faeces trench. Later, we debate the difference in trickles and a complete stool. Cleet says, trickles don't count. You have to stool a stream. Yeah, yeah, the others chortle. Tuesday night I groan, stool and groan. I want to die but can't. I can't make a Bible entry Wednesday. I am too sick. I did keep a record of my bowel movements but can't get beyond my second place 15 of the day before. I ache all over. Why did I eat all that food? My stomach hurts and growls like a dog protecting a bone. I half crawl, half walk to the edge of the floor, lean over and vomit. I turn around, drop my pants and crap until my guts hang out. Thursday, I jump up early and announce, I'm off to sick call, men. Watch my stuff. I return with bicarbonate and advice from the medical man not to eat so much. The Red Cross truck enters the front gate to sounds of loud cheers. Finally, where you all been? Now you get here when it is safe. Give me some doughnuts, ma'am. I ain't had any since I got over here. You got anything else to eat? My mouth is dry. The belches taste like sewer gas, but I turn to pet. Gotta have some doughnuts. Maybe the sweet taste will eliminate the sour belches. I walk with spread legs to the Red Cross tent and gobble down six glazed doughnuts and a large cup of coffee. I return to the barracks, legs still apart to prevent the raw cheeks of my buttocks from touching. I will see you guys, I yell as I walk rapidly to the trench. So much for the doughnuts, I moan upon return. You should not have drunk the coffee, Pet concludes. Yeah, but the doughnuts are so good. Couldn't pass them up. That afternoon we get paper and envelopes to write letters. While I compose notes to both Aunt Louise and my brother Charles, I continue to eat candy, chew and swallow one piece of gum after another, and chain smoke. I am afraid the bubble will burst, and I will wake up cold and hungry. Not taking any chances. Get it while I can, I remind myself while I stuff my face. I express my thanks in the letters for what I am sure are all the family's and friends' prayers, adding that God has responded. Benner comments as he collects the letters about our leaving on Monday, April 9th, depending on how fast the planes can deliver the cans of gas to the armoured units. He confirms the rumour that the Air Corps is flying gas to the front to supply Patton's army. Rather than fly back empty, ex-prisoners of war will fill the bucket seats in the C-47s. Friday, Saturday and Sunday are repetitious of the last couple of days. I am exhausted, but dream of life after internment. As the afternoon sun drops behind the mountain late Sunday, I tell Pet, Well, I guess it is over, buddy. God has done his deed. We are free. I can't ask anything more of him. I think I will take a walk to the top of the hill behind the barracks. At the top, I look beyond the barbed wire fence to the mountain in the distance. I close my eyes. My mind floats beyond Germany, across France, the Atlantic, the United States, and lands in South Alabama. I squeeze my eyes, smack my lips, draw a deep breath and cock an ear. I inhale the salt air, listen to the soft splash of the waves. My eyes open to the white sandy beach at Gulf Shores on the Gulf of Mexico, across the bay from Mobile. The clouds hang over the valley, sitting in solemn judgment on the day. The sun tries one last time to stay above the grey-blue clouds, jagged on the edges but solid in the middle. The rays turn westward and run up and down behind the clouds in an attempt to beam full in a clear sky above the horizon. My eyes glaze over as I watch the clouds hide from the sun. At each flash of the sun I see forms that look like faces from Baker Company, 275th Infantry. I squint but cannot identify anybody. 190 soldiers who came overseas with me struggle up the mountain, bent over with packs, overcoats, shoe packs and rifles. Will I ever see any of them again? Of all the comrades I ate, slept and fought with, only Pettingill, Huckle and Strubinger are still here. Tears run down a dirty, bearded cheek. I shake my head. God, this is no way to think. Give me the strength, the will, the determination to blot out this part of my life and get on with it. I walk back to the barracks. Monday, April 9th. I am one of 24 selected to leave for the delousing tent. Pet, Huck, Strubinger, Tothero and Mahoney are among the group. This eliminates any sad goodbyes. 
We gather our meagre belongings and walk to the main gate. I am so frail and weak, I am pushed and pulled into the covered army truck. My body aches with every move. Cries of anguish and barely audible moans come with every breath. Even the joy of leaving prison camp can't blot out the pain that consumes my body. I don't dare go to the hospital or stay behind, so I don't complain out loud. I raise my head just enough to glance out the rear of the truck as it turns left onto the road to Bad Orb and Stalag 9B fades from view. My stomach is in cramps. I am wet with sweat. My head is as hot as a pancake griddle. The cheeks of my buttocks are raw, and bouncing on the wooden seats makes it worse. No one speaks. There is no jovial bantering, no jokes, no laughs, and certainly no tears, except, perhaps, from pain. The horrors experienced in the past three months fade into the deep recesses of my soul. What would be the effect on me, physically, mentally, psychologically, for however long I might survive? What is my fate? Back into the war? Hospital? I doubt it will be home. I do not dream of the future. The past few months drop into the bottom of my subconscious. It is over, that's all I know. The pain blocks out any pleasant thoughts about the future. I can't think. I have survived and I want to continue to survive. My soul is at peace, blessed by the unseen God, who taps on my hardened and indifferent spirit to let me know that all is well, and he is with me. There is an indescribable sense of ecstasy. The twenty-mile ride from Stalag 9B to the delousing tent on the outskirts of Bad Orb carries me away from prison camp. The army truck bounces, twists and jerks from one side of the road to the other to miss the shell holes. Since my bones are meatless, the ride is hell. First I sit on my hands. Ouch! Next I lean on one cheek of my buttock, then the other one. No relief. I scream. So do the other prisoners of war. Slow down. Not so damn fast. There's no fat on my bony buttocks. Whoa, whoa, man, whoa! The driver pays no attention to our moans and groans. Tears run down my cheeks as I moan. Oh, my God! Every bone in my body aches. My stomach is in knots from all the vomiting. The ticks and fleas in my moustache and goatee itch. I pick and scratch with one hand, sit on the other one. Tears cloud my eyes. I can't see anyone I know. The truck finally gets to the delousing tent. It is too painful to jump, so I am gingerly assisted to the ground. My cramped legs ache when I walk. Throw off those goddamned filthy clothes, then put them in a pile over here so they can be burned, and don't keep the lice with you. Ain't it nice to be back in the army? A meek voice whispers at the raucous and rasping sound of a three-stripe sergeant. The warm shower water is black with three or more months of dirt, crap and other kinds of filth. It is sheer joy to lather my body in a cake of the brown G.I. soap I had complained about, even shunned in my prior army days. The lye in the soap even smells like lavender. It is tragic to see the bodies around me in the shower, if you want to call them bodies. They are skeletons. No one has any buttocks. Shriveled flesh hangs loosely from hips to knees like cured brown tobacco leaves. Wrinkled flesh dangles from arms with bony elbows and enlarged hands. Feet look grotesque attached to the toothpick legs which are covered with hair and skin. Is that you, Gleason? I stare at a head with stringy blonde hair, black pits on each side of a stubby nose. At the end of the tunnels I detect two watery eyes. The twitch of his right eye reveals his identity. Yeah, it is me. At least I have my teeth. Look at that poor son of the earth. I turn to stare into a mouth with a few black teeth and bloody gums. He rattles his head as if clearing it of water. My head drops to avoid the skeletons who were once soldiers. Do I look that bad? Gleason says. You won't win a beauty contest. As I finger the skin drooping from my buttocks, I smile and think, well, the famous Higgins buttocks and piano legs are gone. After the shower, I look at the floor rather than stare at the legs. I follow the other skeleton frames into the delousing tent where I am sprayed with a creosote-smelling liquid. As I leave, someone grabs my arm and sticks a needle in it. My God, it burns! What is it, fire? To prevent typhus. Extra strong, just in case, a medic replies. He hands me a large can and continues. Here, dust yourself with this powder. It will eliminate lice and fleas. Be sure to rub it in your hair. Boy, am I glad Sergeant Ramos is not here. With that hairy body of his, he would use it all. I recognise Pet's voice and yell to him. Hey, Pet, where you been? 
didn't recognize the clean body. Can you imagine those fleas and lice on Sergeant Ramos? They must have had a real feast. In another part of the tent, I get clean used army garments. I notice a big hole over the heart in the field jacket with dried blood around the hole. The patch area once held a triangle, which means the previous owner was a tanker. I ask for another jacket, but get a snide reply. Be happy you were not in it when the hole appeared. That is the closest I have to your size. Just take it. This ain't Brooks Brothers, friend. Another friendly supply sergeant. Lazy man. He wouldn't look for another jacket if his life depended on it. With the help of others from the delousing tent, I climb into a truck with about 25 liberated prisoners of war and ride to a landing strip where we board a C-47. The flight to Camp Lucky Strike in La Havre, France is as painful as the truck ride. The metal bucket seats are aligned along the sides of a C-47. The nauseating odour of gas from the cans used to bring fuel to the front permeates the plane. Oh well, I decide. If that's all I have to put up with to get home, I can stand it. The plane lands for refuelling in Paris. I stretch my legs, get some coffee and doughnuts from the Red Cross, and remark to Pet, well, this is as close as I will get to Gay Paré. We arrive at the airport in La Havre after another shaking flight. Then it is one more cheekbone-to-wood truck ride to Camp Lucky Strike. I am interrogated by American officers. It takes about ten minutes. Name, rank, serial number, unit, when and where captured, where interned. Nothing about the squalid conditions in the prison camp. I guess the army has the information they need or doesn't want to hear any more. The army feels safe in giving us $20 pay. An Eisenhower jacket, named for the Allied Commander-in-Chief, is included with the new uniforms we're issued. We are told, you guys are lucky. These are the first ones to be issued in Europe. For the first time in months, I have a new uniform that fits. The jacket inside breast pocket is great. It prevents a bulge in the hip pants pocket from a wallet. I cram the twenty dollars and pieces of paper with various names and addresses inside the jacket pocket. I put the New Testament diary, the German mess kit, and pieces of paper with recipes in a small duffel bag. I spend three days at Camp Lucky Strike. Most of the soldiers have been released from hospitals, designated fit for duty and await reassignment. The principal topic of conversation among the former prisoners of war is our fate. The war in both Europe and the Pacific is still raging. The rumours remind me of Stalag 9b. Soldiers return from the latrine, the mess hall, every place in Camp Lucky Strike with a new rumour. To the Pacific. A new division is to be formed of all cripples and prisoners of war. Police duty in Germany as towns are captured. One day, while wandering around the camp, I recognise Sergeants Holcomb and Thibodeau. The former was my platoon sergeant and the latter my squad leader. Sergeant Thibodeau's first remark after hugging me was, Higgins, you better shave off that goatee and moustache. You will never get off the boat with them. Oh, come on, Sarge. Give me a break. No orders, please. Anyway, I am not in your squad now. Over coffee and doughnuts, we relate our prison camp stories. They tell of their experiences after leaving Stalag 9B. Holcomb is still mad over the failure of his one attempt to escape. Three of them put together a makeshift French uniform and nonchalantly walked through the gate of their prison camp. We travelled at night, got within earshot of the front lines when it became necessary to go through a town rather than skirt it. We decided to walk through the town as if we owned it. No one stopped us until we got to the last small building in town. Just as we rounded the corner, out stepped a terry guard. Those damned old civilians with only an army coat and a rifle think they are very good. He pointed his rifle at me and said, Alice Caput. He had trailed us through the city, I guess. Higgins, if the scouts, Fellman and Pettingill from the first squad had been with us, we would have made it. Back to prison camp we were marched. I shake my head, laugh and say, You are lucky they did not shoot you, wearing the uniform of another nation. Holcomb shrugs his shoulders. Those guys were just civilians in pieces of army uniforms. They didn't know one enemy from another. Anyway, getting shot would be better than our prison camp. They asked about all the men in the company they had left in Stalag 9B. I told them about Pettingill, Strubinger, Huckle, that Cole, Gleason, Smith, Fellman and Zion left for another camp in February. No one knows what happened to Sergeant Ramos, Company B First Sergeant, Captain Schmied, Company B Commander, nor any of the other officers. None of us mentioned the men dead in action. 
Sergeant Holcomb passes on the rumour we will go to the Riviera for rest and recuperation before reassignment. I mention that Dunbar, from our company, claims he has an aunt who lives in Paris, and if we go to the Riviera we can get a pass and visit her. Yeah, Tibby says, and then back to the front. Thanks, but no thanks. I guess you are right, Sarge. With my luck I would be back in battle. I don't have enough points to go home. If I get a chance to go back to the States, I will take it. On 12th April, it is announced that the first 500 former prisoners of war will leave for the United States aboard a hospital ship, the John Erickson. All of the former prisoners of war gather in front of a tent to listen to the names called for the first shipment. My head and arms ache. My head drops as I tell Dunbar. I am not sure I can make it if my name is called. That second typhus shot yesterday did me in. I lean on Dunbar so I won't fall. My body is soaked from sweating. Dunbar says, hang in there. If your name is called, go, man, go. The officer calling out the name says, here are the last two names, Higgins, Samuel G and Alphonse Willie. The 500 names I just called get over here, ready to go. I can't believe it. I am lucky for the first time in my life. Everyone congratulates me. Dunbar says he will send me a card from Paris, and I will send you one from Mobile. What is your aunt's address? He writes the address on a piece of paper, shoves it in the breast pocket of my Eisenhower jacket, then cautions, Act like you are well, Higgins, or you will never make it. Your skin is yellow, and with that suntan you got sitting outside the barracks in Stalag 9B picking lice, your face is mustard tan. You look terrible. I don't complain during the next bouncing ride. We get off the truck and I walk slowly up the gangplank. As I step up on the deck, a voice yells, Soldier, shave off that moustache and goatee. You have to be clean-shaven when we land in the United States. I snap back a smart-mouth answer. What difference does it make? Is that all you have to worry about? I go into the latrine after I find a bunk and shave off the moustache. That ought to make Mr. G.I. Joe happy. I stay in my bunk during the night. When the ship stops the next morning, I kick the bunk above me and ask, We home already? Damn, that was a fast trip. The guy above me replies, We only crossed the English Channel. We are docked at Southampton to pick up more wounded. I hide my duffel bag under the bunk and drop my Eisenhower jacket on the bunk. My legs shake. My body is sweaty and sore, but I am curious as to what is going on topside. As I struggle to the side of the ship, I hear a rasping voice. It is you again, soldier. I told you when you got on board to shave off that goatee, or you don't get off the ship. You heard me. Shave it off. Where are you bunked? Oh, come on, sir. I shaved off the moustache. Let me keep the goatee. No way. Off it comes. I ask you again, soldier. Where are you bunked? I lie. Oh, hell, I think, of all the people on this ship. Why did I have to run into him? I struggle down the steps to my bunk. My mouth falls open. My Eisenhower jacket is gone, with all those addresses, and my wallet, too. I look under the bunk and find the duffel bag, but no jacket. I ask the soldier above me if he has seen anyone. He replies, You should have had better sense than to leave anything lying around. Didn't you learn that in prison camp? I lie in my bunk, too sick to eat or even move. As soon as I am confident the ship is at sea, I report to the sick bay. The ship sways from side to side in the rough sea. Waves splash on the deck. I hold onto a rope to keep from washing overboard and finally get down the steps to the sick bay. The medical officer looks at me. Get this soldier into bed. He is yellow. I believe he has yellow jaundice. I complain bitterly about my missing jacket with all the papers in the pocket. As I struggle to stay conscious, I hear the announcement on the ship's intercom asking for the return of the jacket and papers. Nothing is ever returned. The semi-hospital ship tosses in the North Sea like a toy boat. It is a semi-hospital ship because it is armed, even though it has Red Cross emblems all over the sides and deck. I wonder if the German subs can see these in the fog. I sure hope so. The announcement is made that President Roosevelt died the day before the ship left Southampton. I am too sick to attend the services on deck. It takes about two weeks to cross the Atlantic. Two days before we land in New York, I get out of the hospital. When I return to my bunk, I find my duffel bag under the bunk, but no sign of the jacket or all those names and addresses. I go up on deck to bemoan my loss. I can see a convoy spread out over the entire surface of the sea. 
I am fascinated with the destroyer escorts that dart between the ships. I look at the soldiers on deck, but do not recognize one person from Starlag 9B. Everyone has eaten so much they are bloated beyond recognition. Thank goodness, while in the sick bay, I have been too weak to eat. Then, that loud, obnoxious voice that bellows like a horse in heat. I freeze in my tracks. Soldier, I thought I told you to shave off that goatee. Now come with me and I will watch you shave it off. Who the hell is this guy? Has he been waiting for me to get out of sick bay? Okay, sir, I will shave it off. You bet you will, because I'm going to follow you to the head and watch. I wonder if this character has ever been in prison camp. I doubt it. Otherwise, he would not insist on such a trivial matter. On 28th April 1945, the John Erickson lands in New York. The seats are softer on the bus to Camp Kilmer, New Jersey. The place crawls with print and radio reporters and newsreel cameras. Hey man, we are heroes, the first prisoners of war to return home. Wow, ain't it great to be greeted with open arms? Where are the girls? It didn't take long for someone to think of sex with a full belly and good night's sleep. After assignment to a barracks, we get to call home. My first question to Aunt Louise in Mobile after all the greetings, what holds the vanilla wafers together when you make a lemon ice box pie? She thinks I have lost it. What? I repeat the question and say it is important. She replies, nothing. It just does. The juice from the mixture makes the crust stick when you brown it in the oven. Ha! I thought so. After discussions about the whereabouts of everyone, I hang up and head for the next barracks to find Mahoney. He walks toward me with a dejected look. Here is your ten bucks. I just talked to my mom and she agrees with you. She says I am crazy asking such a dumb question. In a barely audible voice, he adds, She should have been there. We wish each other good luck, hug and depart. As I wander around Camp Kilmer, I hear about a fellow broadcasting on the radio from one of the barracks. It is the Blue Network of NBC. My brother Charles works for that network, so I ask the announcer if he knows him. The guy nearly jumps out of his skin. Yes, I know Charlie. Stand right there. Let me see if I can locate him. He finds Charlie at home. I hear the announcer say something like, And now, folks, we will listen to a conversation between a former prisoner of war as he talks to his brother in New York. He hands me the microphone. Talk. With emotion at both ends of the line, we forget the broadcast and just talk. Charles, ever the older brother, gives me advice. As soon as you get home, write down all those experiences before you forget them. I can get it published. That is hot news right now, and for God's sake spell cannot, can't, and not can't. A tried and true public relations man. On May 1st, 1945, those of us who live in the southboard trains for Fort McPherson in Atlanta, Georgia. We arrive after two days full of soot from the coal-fired engine that came through the open window of the day coach. The motley group stumbles along in the hot, humid May weather to a large room. The soldier in charge announces, I have the orders that gives each of you a 60-day furlough. The white soldiers will report to Miami Beach on July 3rd. The two Negro soldiers, Higgins and Alphonse, will report to Atlantic City. Well, so that is why I was last on the list to leave Camp Lucky Strike. The combination of yellow jaundice and suntan gave my skin a tan Hershey chocolate appearance. I yell, I am not a Negro and I am not going to Atlantic City. He bangs on his head. Well, I will be damned. You are white. Oh, brother, I just got busted from Sergeant. See where the stripes were. He points to his sleeve. Now, another mistake. Well, they can't bust me any lower than a private. He continues. You go on home. I will be sure you get another set of orders, making you white and sending you to Miami Beach. I make out like a bandit on this colour deal. Alabama only sells liquor in state-owned stores. Soldiers on leave can purchase one bottle per set of orders, which are punched to prevent additional purchases. Since I have 60 sets of orders, I can buy 60 bottles of liquor. Eventually, I get a letter from Atlantic City. It rescinds the prior orders and instructions to report to Miami Beach, 5th July, 1945. But the real treat is another 60 copies of my orders. No one in my family drinks, so my 120 orders provide all my friends and their friends sufficient liquor for parties galore. The liquor store employees are suspicious of me, but after reading the orders, they just smile. Better you than some draft dodger. 
Since butter and meat are rationed, I trade the liquor for chits to buy meat, butter and cheese. Being tagged a negro sure paid off. My aunt gives me the letters I sent from prison camp. The telegram from the army listing me as missing in action is dated 1st February 1945. The one returning me to military control was 24th April 1945. Then on 25th April 1945, my aunt receives notice I am on the way back to the United States. I call her on April 28th 1945. She is angry at the rapid turn of events but adds, At least you are home, skinny but safe. I can put meat on those bones. God has answered our prayers. The phone call from the newspaper for an interview embarrasses me. I don't want to have an interview, but relent under pressure from my aunt. I do not consider myself a hero. I only feel guilt and shame at being captured in my first battle. There are others from Mobile who had been prisoners of war for two or three years, and some lost limbs or life. Reluctantly, I consent to an interview. My comments to the reporter are factual. The skimpy menu, general living conditions, chopping wood. How do you describe sadness or remorse over friends dead in battle, or death from starvation or disease in prison camp? Can words describe the filth, the weakness, the hollow-eyed expressions on bodies that smelled and had festering sores? Or how the mere mention of meningitis or another possible epidemic struck fear in our hearts? Would a reporter understand the four-inch diameter black spots on both my hips from sleeping on the floor? I doubt it. I even lied about the weight loss. I weighed 90 pounds, fully clothed at the delousing tent, and that was after a week of gorging myself. My weight when captured was 155. No one, except a caged animal, can understand or appreciate existing, not living, behind electrified wire. Sure, a person will say, tisk, tisk, how horrible, but will these experiences be burned on their soul? I doubt it, so I keep quiet. After a few days at home, I hitchhike to my beloved Gulf of Mexico. I don't have a car. It is easy to catch a ride, especially when in uniform. I walk on the white sand in front of the Gulf Shore Pavilion, recall my high school days when a cousin and her husband operated it. I sit on the sand and watch the jellyfish float in a quiet, soft surf. Even the seaweed looks good. The sand fleas scamper at the speed of light dig into the sand when the water rushes back from the beach to the surf, afraid to be caught naked, I guess. These inch-long crustaceans live in a rough-and-tumble world where the waves meet the beach, sort of like life. You've got to stay on the run to keep out of the way, to survive. I recall how I used a metal tea strainer to catch the fleas before they could escape the waves. The vastness of the water beyond the foam that gently washes ashore reminds me of the omnipresence of God. The early May sun warms my body. I wiggle my toes in the cool, wet sand, push my feet below the surface. My eyes blur and moisten as I watch each wave form in the distance, rise gently, and reveal the face of a B Company soldier I knew in Stalag 9B. Robert Zion was tall and red-headed, with the doer eyes of an owl. Dark-haired Homer Smith was from Dothan, Alabama. I wonder if he got home. He left prison camp with the non-coms, even though he wasn't one. I pick up a handful of sand, let it fall through my fingers, and wonder if he was luckier than the rest of us. Here comes Melvin Prey, with his thin, long black hair and serious eyes. I didn't see my ammunition bearer after we got to Stalag 9B, even though he was in the next barracks. A wave forms out in the gulf. I watch as it picks up speed. Hey, there is the face of Fred Gleason, the quick-witted, happy-go-lucky Irishman from Boston. He left prison camp in late February along with Hugh Cole. I shake my head as the sharp-nosed face of Hugh appears beside Fred. His mouth forms that Virginia accent of ought and about. Will we have the meal Fred, Pet and I swore we would have? Down the beach I see a wave form offshore. As it comes by me on my right on its way to the beach, I see the flash of sunlight reveal the steel glasses of the six-foot red-headed body of Russell Huckle. He cocks his head sideways and winks. Behind him is the helmetless head of Don Pettingill. Further back, I see the head of Norm Fellman and the smile that cracks the corner of his mouth as he says, How the hell did a small twerp like you get home so fast? I missed Norm's jovial bantering since the days at Fort Leonard Wood. I hated to see him leave Starlag 9B. He was in a group of 300 that included Robert Zion and a few others from our barracks. 
Norm was segregated before he left prison camp because he was Jewish. Zion said he was not Jewish and stayed with our group until he left with the 300. I wonder what happened to him and whether or not he was Jewish. The sun is warm. I lie on the sand, cover my eyes, and think about others in my company. Captain William Schmied shot before we were captured and carried away in a jeep by the Germans, with First Sergeant Carlos Ramos holding his head, tears in his eyes. I didn't realise First Sergeants had compassion. There is Lieutenant Edward Groffy, Executive Officer, and Lieutenant Francis Botrick, my platoon leader, Platoon Sergeant Tom Holcomb, Squad Leader Walton Thibodeau, and Joseph Albert, Platoon Sniper. I recall Paul Gartenman, and how lucky he was to leave the company to be an interpreter for the battalion commander before we got captured, and just because he could speak German. Company B, 275th Infantry, 70th Division, was a happy-go-lucky group of soldiers, a well-oiled machine. In one day the realism of life rolled over us like an avalanche from Pike's Peak. All the thoughts, dreams, aspirations and big talk of our youth were shattered and scattered to the winds. Were we lucky? Would any of us have lived through the war if we hadn't been captured? Who is alive now? Only God knows, and he ain't telling. I sit up and take the envelope, found on a table in my home from my pocket. In the distinct handwriting of Uncle Leon I read, We of the younger generation look steadfastly to a world future, when the crescendo of screaming shells shall have ended. A future when this nightmare of blood, sweat and tears shall pass and to the dawning of a more beautiful day when we may again practice the pursuit of a peaceful living and resume the quest for happiness. How beautiful and prophetic. I didn't realise he was sentimental, much less poetic. Did he copy this quote? It is analogous to Churchill's blood, sweat, toil and tears speech. So what? It is still poetic. For me, a new day has arrived. I am home. I am free. My quest for happiness? I am not sure about that. For now I am happy just walking and sitting on the beach. I look at the blue sky and watch the puffs of white clouds drift eastward. To find what is beautiful in life, to think and act happy, is to me the essence of serenity. No use thinking about the past. It is over, just as a wave becomes foam when it hits the beach. The beach is swept clean and the noises of humanity have not yet begun. My days in Stalag 9b are over. The past is gone, or at least buried in my psyche. A glance seaward reminds me that each day is a new beginning, a new chapter in the pageant of life. My stomach growls. I recall a letter I sent home from Stalag 9b, in which I wrote that when liberated, I would appreciate the small things in life. I belch as my stomach continues to growl. I smack my lips. I taste lemon. There is one piece of lemon pie left in the refrigerator. Right now that is the future. That will make me happy.